All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, I think we're set to get started. We have about 20 of you on the call. Um, if you have any issues seeing the PowerPoint or presentation, please just chat me and let me know if you have any trouble hearing me, if my connection is breaking up. Um, I'm happy, happy to be interrupted at any time. And for those of you who are joining, I think your video and your audio are automatically turned off. Um, if you have any issues that you want to bring up, you can always chat them into the box. And actually today, I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible because I want this to be a learning process for all of us. So I will be asking all of you to chat answers into the box and have a discussion and conversation with me um, throughout the next hour. So just by way of introduction, I am Bianca Wynn. If we haven't had the pleasure of meeting before, I am a public psychiatry fellow at Coordinated Behavioral Care. I completed my residency in general adult psychiatry at Columbia just last year. And I've been joining CBC um, every month to do a training. And, and uh, last month I gave this same talk to a group of our Pathway Home team members. Um, and thought that I would repeat it again because uh, some other people uh, found it to be useful. So we'll just kick things off today. And it should take um, maybe 40, 45 minutes, hopefully, and then we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, but like I said, I, I really encourage all of you to um, be engaged and as active as you can in this process. Um, one thing I will start off by saying is that the mental status exam is different for everyone. Um, I think we all have um, different ranges of experiences and different ways of doing it. So I wanna note that right off the bat. Um, and the way that I'm presenting things to you today might be different from how you learned it, but this is just the way that um, I've learned it in the past and I'm and, and happy to share that with you. So just to get things started, I wanted to ask the group um, and hear from all of you and, and really leverage your expertise. In your own words, um, maybe one or two of you or a couple of you just type in some thoughts that come up uh, when you're asked, what is the mental status exam? How might you describe it to someone? What are some other words you might use to explain what a mental status exam is? And feel free to use the chat box to type in any responses. You can choose, to, I think, to type just to me as a panelist or to all panelists and attendees. Okay, so I see a brief descri description of someone's current functioning, appearance, and presentation. Observation of presentation of the client, their thought process, appearance, speech, symptoms. Any other ways of describing a mental status exam? Okay, got a way of gauging and capturing a client's level of function, appearance, and presentation as it is observed during the session. Okay, so a lot of common elements here, and if you have other ways of describing it, please feel free to enter it into the box. So what I'm getting is um, it's a way of describing. It's something that you are seeing, something that you are observing. I've also noted that there are multiple components that each of you have commented on. So thinking about appearance, um, thought process, speech, um, what else they might be displaying, and that it's also captured at a certain moment in time during a session. So these are all great. And um, what I wrote down is that a mental status exam is a structured assessment made up of objective and subjective findings. It's a medical examination. That's an extension of the physical exam. So when you think about the physical exam, going to the doctor's office, getting your routine annual. Um, you know, they're looking into your eyes, into your nose, into your ears, uh, the back of your throat, listening to your heart, auscultating or using their stethoscope to listen to, the, to your lungs, um, you know, feeling on your belly. All of those things are uh, similar in a way to the way that we use a mental status exam in the sense that it is also structured um, and that it's done in a way that's standardized each time when we're evaluating someone. 
The difference here is that this is made up of objective findings, so what anyone else might say, and subjective findings, things that the client might say themselves, and also the way in which we're perceiving someone. Um, it's also helpful to think about what mental status exams are used for. So they're used for diagnostic purposes, to think about um, a certain diagnosis, how we're formulating a certain case, prognostic measures that can tell us how well someone is doing or how poorly someone might be doing in terms of functioning. And then also for therapeutic purposes, it can really tell us if someone has improved over time or not and kind of direct us in terms of treatment um, and, and how best to engage a client at, at any given time. Okay, so some of you have already entered these things into the chat box, but I'd love to hear from more of you and those of you who have already responded. Um, what are some of the main components of the mental status exam? Feel free to chat that into the box. You can do one or a couple, whatever comes to mind. We have appearance, so the way that someone looks, their thought process and their speech. Great, mood and affect, insight. More about physical appearance, speech, thought and affect. Thought content, excellent. We're missing just a couple more. Attention and concentration, so getting at um, cogn cognitive abilities. What else? Great, thinking about um, a safety assessment that gets to thought content in terms of suicidality and homicidality. Okay, insight, intelligence, and orientation that all gets to cognitive judgment as well, suicidal ideation. Memory, excellent. I think maybe there are two missing, at least from my list. Oh, self-concept, okay. So commenting on, on that as well during mental status exam. Behavior and motor activity, excellent. There's maybe one more. Excellent. Unusual perceptions and hallucinations. Great. Okay, so all together, um, we came to a consensus and there's a group effort to come up with all of them. So that's what I have as well. So here on my list, I have appearance, behavior, speech, mood, affect, thought process, thought content, perceptions, insight, judgment, and cognition. And cognition includes um, many of the things that you entered in, including orientation and memory, for example. And thought content, I would also put suicidality and homicidality in there as well. Um, so what we're gonna do over the next uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes is I'm gonna go through each component of this and we'll do the same talking to each other through the chat box, thinking about what things you might want to comment on. I'll tell you about things that I like to comment on and I really wanna open it up to q and A. I I think many times um, I have always learned how others have done mental status exams and it's been great for me. So as much as you can share with me ways in which you might do it or things that you might comment on, um, please feel free to enter it into the chat box. Okay. So here on the left, I'm giving a sample mental status exam. And as I noted before, we're all interfacing with mental status exams in different ways. You might be a case manager who might be reading through these in notes. Um, you might be a peer or um, a provider. Uh, sorry, I'm getting unstable internet connection. Uh, who might be documenting it on your own and evaluating someone at the point of contact. Um, or you might be someone who's administrative and might come across it uh, just when you're processing notes or something like that. But I want you to be able to, at the end of the day, be able to understand some of the basic components of this and language around it. And if there are any words that don't make sense, things that you need clarification on, please let me know. Okay, so we're gonna start off with appearance. And here again is the sample on the left and we're gonna go through the components on the right. And I've made note each time of whether or not this is something observed in terms of what we are seeing, the provider um, in the room, or if this is something that the client is telling you, which is more subjective. The way I like to think about appearance is how would you describe how a person looks? So 
so that one could identify them out of a room full of people. Um, if you're presenting someone to me and I'm walking into a crowded emergency department, am I going to be able to pinpoint exactly which person you were describing to me? Um, so into the chat box, can you guys tell me what are some things that you might comment on in appearance? Okay, the way that they're dressed and interesting, commenting if it's appropriate or inappropriate, and their hygiene, maybe some features that stand out about them, their approximate age. Great, so kind of their habitus, height, weight, scars, and tattoos. Their build, if they're obese or thin, their eye contact if they appear their stated age or not, any facial features, hair, if they appear disheveled. Okay, excellent. So that's what I have here as well. So um, commenting on stature and build can be helpful again, just being able to point someone out in a room. Um, posture, how are they standing? Um, are they seated upright with their back up straight? Oh, this is excellent too. I saw this from Yarden. When assessing the Atala health, I would write how much of their body is visible. I think that's excellent because you can't see everything and that's something to note in your mental status exam as well. Um, if you're unable to comment on a certain aspect of their body, why is that? And giving the context I think is really important. So thank you for that, absolutely. Um, posture, what kinds of things can you tell from someone's posture? Say if they're slumped over or if their back is up straight, Why does that matter? Their level of stress, their confidence, how they're feeling that day maybe. Absolutely, can see something with their health. I was gonna say it can tell you if they're in pain or not, or if they're uncomfortable. Absolutely something about their mood. And others of you have commented, so that's all very helpful. And others of you commented on the next piece about whether or not their age appearing. And sometimes you'll see, um, you know, appears uh, older than stated age, appears younger than stated age. I think what that tells you is um, a degree of the level of stress that a person has been through or the number of health issues that a person might have that might cause them to look older or more haggard in a way. Um, are there a lot of substances being used? Is there some kind of strife or adversity that they've had in life that causes them to look or present the way that they do? Um, if they're looking younger, do they have a state at which they are presenting as more regressed, appearing more childlike perhaps? Um, it can also tell you things about their confidence. If they, I get told this all the time that I look younger than my age. Um, what does that say about them? And how do they respond to that? And how do they go out in the world presenting the way that they look? Um, others of you commented on grooming and hygiene that tells you about, to some extent, a degree of how well they're taking care of themselves. I've um, had some peers actually tell me in the past that uh, they know that they're having a good day when they're um, wearing lipstick. Um, and as soon as they're, they're not putting lipstick on, that means that they're not feeling well. And there might be subtle signs like that for each member. It could be the complete opposite. Um, and I'm also seeing also the significance of appearance and gender identity as well. Absolutely. Um, and uh, that gets into how they present themselves with hair or makeup. Um, sometimes I don't comment on it at all. Um, I might say they might be wearing a little bit of makeup, but if it's something that is really standing out to me, if it's bright blue eyeshadow, bright red lipstick, something that you're not used to seeing, I would definitely comment on that. And something in mental status exam is, it is all about change. Mental status exam is a data point. We have no data or trends without two data points. So you always wanna be able to have some kind of baseline to compare it to. Um, and to think about how might you compare this mental status, status exam that you're writing right now to something in the future. Um, so I always want you to think about things on kind of a continuum or a line and having two data points to look at. The other thing I typically comment on, and this is related to um, talking about whether or not this is a telehealth session, is to talk about the situation at hand. Are they lying in a hospital bed? Um, 
you know, with a breathing tube on, for example? Are they seated in the day room and looking pretty comfortable around you? Um, are they uh, only visible from their chest stop? Um, are they pacing the room? Uh, are they outside of their apartment uh, and not letting you in? Um, really trying to give a snapshot in time of what that moment looks like uh, for someone who's reading so that they can look at the rest of your note in context of that meeting. And finally, one of you noted pertinent scars or tattoos. That's one of my favorite things to ask about if someone's open to it. Um, and again, I'll note it mostly if I think it has some kind of significance, um, maybe for where they've been in life um, or things that they've gone through before. So excellent. Okay, so thinking through behavior, and I know a lot of this is review for all of you, but I always find it helpful to go through. I think of behavior as also something that you observe. You could um, comment on this without even engaging with someone. Um, and the way I think about behavior is, how is the person interacting with you throughout the interview? Um, can you build rapport with them? How well are you able to build rapport with them? And how are they responding to the situation at hand? Um, this, I think, really influences the reader who goes through your mental status exam. If someone is hostile, irritable, um, aggressive towards you, it might make sense that you weren't able to get a detailed history from them at that time. Um, or um, if someone is uh, very quiet or withdrawn, you might not be able to get certain information as well. And we have to put everything into context. What kinds of things do you all like to put down or note in behavior? You could even be words that you might write down specifically or, or different categories of things. Eye contact. Okay, so this gets to rapport, what Jessica is saying, if they appear friendly or guarded. If they look physically agitated, yeah, so how they're moving, what their body language is telling you. Facial tics, absolutely. Again, that's some kind of movement that you're observing on their body. Absolutely, thinking about clients who may overshare or be overly open sharing about themselves and, and how, how they are with boundaries, absolutely. How well they're engaged, how they're moving their body language, their expressions, excellent. So absolutely, I have the same things down on my list as well. The way that I think about behavior is I break it down into three components and it can, it can be much more than this. And you know, another rule of thumb is um, mental status exams can become very jargony very quickly. And uh, I remember spending so much time trying to write, write them out and using the correct language. And I finally was relieved and given freedom when I was told by a supervisor to just write what I'm saying, just describe it in my own words. Um, that's the best way that you're gonna be able to explain it to someone else and the way that you're gonna understand what you wrote previously. Um, so the three big categories I think about with behavior are attitude, some words that I have, and you guys have gotten to this, I might say they're a little bit um, guarded. Uh, so meaning that they might have a wall up um, from you and, and not share as much information um, as readily. They might be suspicious. They might feel overly familiar. Again, so maybe crossing some boundaries here or there. Um, they might be preoccupied, really attentive and focused on the interview. Um, are they pleasant, um, uninterested? Are they irritable or falling asleep? Are they impatient with you or acutely distressed? Um, so just really stressed in the moment, or are they bored? You know, how are they approaching the interview and how are they regarding you at the time that you're interfacing with them? Um, I also comment on motor activity. Uh, so here I'll talk about um, tics as, as one of you mentioned. So those are again, quick spasms or jerks that someone might have. It could be in their face, it could be an entire shoulder. Um, if there are any involuntary movements, 
And um, I also comment on tremulousness if they're uh, if they have tremors or if they're rigid in one of their muscles. The reason why this is really important, especially for me as a psychiatrist, if you're commenting on it, is it can allude to some kind of um, dystonic reaction uh, to a medication. So a dystonic reaction being um, having a muscle seize up in response to something like an antipsychotic medication, for example. Um, one time I remember noting in um, one of my notes that uh, a patient that I was evaluating in the CPAP actually had her eyes staring straight up at the ceiling. I think I commented on it in appearance and then also behavior that she wasn't making eye contact. Um, actually, I think it was a medical student who commented on this and we went back to evaluate the patient and it turns out that she was actually having um, a side effect and a dystonic reaction where the muscles of her eyes had frozen um, because of an antipsychotic medication that she had taken. And we had to give her prompt treatment right away. So it can be uh, incredibly informative to include this type of information in your exam. I also talk about um, pacing. Sometimes I might put it in appearance, sometimes I put it in behavior, but I, I often address their gait. Um, how they're walking. Are they walking very slowly? If you're able to observe them walking around the room, are they shuffling their feet? Could that tell us something about their health status um, or something neurological uh, in their brain um, or something about um, you know, their muscles and how well they're able to support themselves and get around? I also talk about eye contact. Um, and one of you mentioned that as well. One lesson that I learned is um, sometimes it's not enough to say if it's good eye contact, because what does good eye contact mean? Good eye co contact could mean that someone is um, holding your gaze, um, but just because they're holding their gaze, there's a quality to their eye contact that you wanna comment on. So they could be holding your gaze, but is it intense? Are they not blinking and staring at you? Um, you might wanna comment on that in terms of how that makes you feel when they're looking at you that way. So oftentimes I, I might say they're, they have good and appropriate eye contact, um, something that I feel safe and comfortable with. I might say that they have intense eye contact, avoidant, wandering, looking around the room, um, or just staring straight ahead without blinking. I like this too. I use fleeting for eye contact versus avoidant. I think that makes a lot of sense because I think that um, avoidant can come across as uh, being subjective. I might feel that they're avoiding me, um, but they might be uh, holding eye contact or not holding eye co contact with me for many different reasons. And I think fleeting is, is a much more neutral term. So I really like that. And please share, guys, if you have other things that you want to include here, um, feel free to chat it in. Okay, next we're going to move to speech. Um, so again, this is something that is observed, that's objective, and it's what you hear. Um, the way I think about it is how would you describe how someone speaks or how they sound? Of note, this is not the content at all of what they're saying. This is just about the quality of their speech. Um, what kinds of things do you comment on here in speech? Maybe specific words that you've used again or, or different categories um, of how you might uh, explain uh, someone's speech. Okay, so some descriptors may include the pace at which they're speaking, their tone, their volume, if it's loud or soft. Clear or unclear, can you understand what they're saying? Are they able to articulate what they're saying? Okay. So I have a couple of things that I comment on um, and I bolded them here, uh, different descriptors that I use. I think about um, speech in two different categories. One is the quality of their speech, quality of their voice. And then I think about the quantity, how many words per second, how many words per minute are they putting out? So under quality, I usually start off with um, their initiation. So their ability to start conversation on their own, their ability to start um, a verbal response on their own. So I think about that as being spontaneous versus non-spontaneous. Spontaneous is someone coming to the room and having a conversation with you, asking you about how your day was, um, making comments about things. 
versus non-spontaneous? Is it really difficult to prompt them to speak? Um, are they only responding? Sorry, I'm getting, sorry, my internet connection is unstable for a second. Um, are they only responding uh, directly to the questions that you're asking? Um, is it a slow response? After you ask a question, could it be that it takes several beats before they're actually able to respond? And that tells you that um, there's some speech latency there. And that can be for a number of different reasons. They could be shy. They could have a cognitive deficit. Um, they could be experiencing psychosis in the moment. But it just tells you um, how, uh, how someone's able to engage with speech, to what degree of um, difficulty or ease. I talk about volume, is it normal, loud, soft, are they barely audible where you have to lean in um, and they're whispering. I think about fluency, so um, are they able to kind of speak continuously um, or are they stuttering? Is their language more clipped and kind of shortened? Um, you might also see the word prosodic or prosody. Many of you might be familiar with this. It took me a while to understand it. The way that I understand it is it's um, the sing-song quality of someone's voice. So you can note my voice is going up and down. And the opposite of that would be a monotonous voice, just having one tone or a flat tone. I think about articulation, um, which is something that Elizabeth just commented on. Um, is their speech clear or is it slurred? One thing that I often wrote about uh, when I was in CPAP was that someone was dysarthric, meaning they're having difficulty articulating or difficulty um, uh, pronouncing or, or making words, sorry, sound audible um, and easily understandable. And sometimes I say it's secondary to a dentulousness, which me just means that they don't have any teeth. Um, you know, if you don't have teeth or you have something in your mouth or you have um, some kind of other abnormality uh, in your oral cavity or in your mouth, it might make it difficult for you to speak. Um, I talk about rate and speed. Is it normal, rapid, fast or slow? And you'll often see pressured. Um, and the way that I think about pressured speech, I know many times we relate it to um, a manic episode. The way that it's defined is not necessarily that it's just the rate not necessarily that it's just fast. The actual quality of pressured speech is that it is difficult to interrupt you. Someone may be speaking agonizingly slow. It's very rare, but they might be speaking very slow and you still can't get a word in. Um, and that would be pressured speech. And then I think about quantity. So are they um, producing many words per second or minute? Are they minimally responsive? Um, or are they limited to yes or no responses? Sometimes I might write, um, that they are uh, monosyllabic, uh, monosyllabic responses, meaning just one word answers. Okay, so how about mood? Um, I think of mood as being subjective, for me at least, and I don't know um, what your practice is, but I was taught to always put mood in direct quotation marks. These are words spoken directly by a client um, in response to a question of how are you feeling today? Um, or how are you? And the way I think of it is it's the individual's primary feeling state or emotional state during the interaction. And, and you, know, um, you know, they might say a couple of different things and there might be one or two words that might stand out to you that really illustrates their mood. Um, so some examples that I've gotten in the past um, could be, you know, I'm feeling awful or sad, down, not good, I'm okay, I'm fantastic, I feel like nothing can stop me. All of these things would be in direct quotation marks and not something that I'm assuming of them, but something that instead that they've directly told me. Okay, so how about affect? Um, affect is also something that is observed, something that you're seeing and hearing. Um, this to me is how, how you would describe the individual's expression and emotion based on their nonverbal language. Um, what are some words you might use to describe affect? What are some things that you all might put here? Their affect is incongruent or flat. They could be really animated. Their affect could be blunted. It could be appropriate to content versus inappropriate. Again, is their affect congruent? Does it coincide with their mood or not? Mm. 
euthymic. Excellent. Great. Great. So I think about all of these things as well. And the way I've heard it described before is that affect, um, if I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was taught to me at one point, I think it was something like, um, it's like a radio dial. So you can think about um, what station you're on, on the radio. And that tells you, you know, the type of the emotional state that you're observing. And then if you think about the volume um, for, that, uh, for that radio dial, that can tell you the intensity or the range of affect um, that's displayed. So there are a couple of ways that I think about affect and I usually comment on four things um, all within this category. First, I think about the range, again, the volume dial, the range of affect or variation of emotions displayed. So I think about it as a continuum, flat being that um, they're not showing any emotion at all, um, happy or sad. The next step up would be blunted. Um, the next step up would be constricted. Blunted, I usually think um, more related to um, psychotic disorders. Constricted might be someone who's incredibly depressed um, or withdrawn. Then I think about a normal or full range affect. Usually what that means is, are they able to smile when they come in and say hi to you? They can laugh at a joke if you made it. Um, but would they also feel really sad if they were talking about um, someone who just passed or some kind of event or adversity that they just went through? So they're able to display all of those emotions fairly well and fairly appropriately. That means that they have a normal or full range of affect. <clears throat> oh, okay. That could be the chat box, actually. Thank you so much for letting me know that. Let me just close out the chat. Um, and let me close this as well. Is this better? I think that should work. OK, excellent. Um, I think about, uh, sorry, up from normal or full um, affect, I think about someone being expansive, so filling the room, having um, more intense emotion than you would expect. And then labile um, is, uh, you know, to the nth degree. One second they're sobbing, crying, maybe at the drop of a pin, and then the next second they're laughing, um, ecstatic, really happy, kind of jumping off the walls. Um, after range, I think about the emotional state that's observed. So again, this is the radio station. So they could be dysphoric, which is just another word for sad or down. Euthymic would mean normal. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're extremely happy. Um, and then euphoric, I think, as being very happy. I comment on other things, too, that I see. So I'll say things like they, they look sad or they're tearful. They're annoyed or anxious, excited or irritable. And another thing I'll say is um, sometimes they don't display the same affect throughout the entire session. So it might be actually that. Um, I might say, you know, initially they appeared incredibly um, euphemic, um, but later on uh, they became more anxious as we were discussing X, Y, and Z, or they became more excited when we were discussing their birthday party or something like that. Um, I think about congruency, many of you mentioned that as well. The, uh, the importance of this is, does what you're observing in terms of their nonverbal language actually match how that person is describing their own feeling state and their mood? So for example, um, someone might tell you that they feel good and happy, and you might write that in your mood section in qu direct quotation marks, um, but they appear tearful throughout and withdrawn and not maintaining eye contact with you. Um, and so noting that is really important. Is there something that they're not processing? Um, is there something that they're having difficulty coping with to the degree that whatever they're saying about how they feel is not matching with what you're observing? And, and that, clues you in, I think, to treatment and how to engage someone um, down the line. And then finally, uh, one of you mentioned this as well, I think about appropriateness. Um, is the affect you observe appropriate to the subject of the conversation? Are they um, laughing? Hey, Bianca, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, the black box has come out over the presentation again. Um, where are you seeing it? Uh, on the left-hand side, right under cognition. Oh, okay, this is an empty spot. I just have the video up here. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, let me see if I can turn it off. Hold on. Is that better? Yes, now it's gone. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you, Chevy. 
Uh, so for appropriateness, you know, are they laughing hysterically if you're talking about the death of a loved one? Um, that's definitely something that you would want to comment on as well. Okay. So moving through for thought process, this is something that you observe. It's based on what you hear. Um, and uh, this is how well the client's thoughts appear to be organized. Um, what are some words that you might use to describe someone's thought process? I'm gonna have the black box up again, which is just my chat box here. So tangential, coherent or incoherent, circumstantial, yep. Okay. Absolutely. These are all things that you might put in for thought process. So the way that I think about it, and forgive my um, PowerPoint drawing skills here. So this is the way that I uh, was taught in medical school. And this is the way that I like to think about it again on a continuum, very similar to how we were talking about affect ranging from flat to labile. I think about thought process also existing on a continuum. Um, so the way I think about it is um, at baseline, uh, many people can be uh, linear, logical, goal-directed, what they're saying makes sense to you, the points um, that they're making string together very clearly. And again, here you can see it depicted by this line going, getting straight to the point after you ask them a question. Someone might be circumstantial. Um, this is where uh, someone talks around a point. So um, you might ask them a question about um, how their day is, and they might start you know, from three years ago, and then go all the way around the point of today, but then they eventually do end up there. Um, that's the way that I think of circumstantial. Tangential, they might start around the point that you're asking about, but then they will quickly veer off from that. So you're asking them about how their day was, and then they might talk to you about something that happened 10 years ago that has nothing to do at all with how their day went um, today or you know, some kind of event that happened in their lives. Um, so again, here they just veer off course, although they do touch briefly upon the point that you're asking about. Um, the next step, again, and this is going from organized to disorganized thought process, the next step down um, in ter terms of disorganization is loosening of associations. So they're making uh, many statements and comments um, that are, again, as the word says, very loosely related, um, but they don't quite make sense. They're not following in a line. Um, each point is not following the next. Um, next level of disorganization is flight of ideas. Their ideas are going in multiple different directions. They really have nothing to do with one another. And then finally, um, the most disorganized would be word salad, which you would get um, with very extreme or severe um, disorders of psychosis. And uh, this is just represented by discrete words um, that have no connection to one another, no phrases that are connected in any way, shape, or form. Um, and it, it kind of sounds like gibberish when it comes out, but it could be words that you might recognize, but again, strung together, they don't actually have any meaning. Um, I hope that this is helpful. If there's any questions about this, this took me some time um, to get used to and, and keep in mind, but I hope that the visual is helpful. Okay, so thinking about thought content. <clears throat> so thought content is subjective. This is based on what the client tells you on their own and what you're hearing from them in response to the questions that you're asking. Um, so I think about what is the subject matter on this patient's mind? What are they currently thinking about? Um, you know, what's preoccupying their mind uh, most of this session? So things I comment on as well, um, just to make sure, sometimes I might say that the thought content is appropriate to, to interview or focused on interview, um, or you know, it might be something like um, focused on housing. That might be the topic that we're talking about that day. Um, and again, it's helpful for context. It could be that you're trying to talk about um, taking medications or not, and someone is focused on housing. That's something to note down um, and, to, and to make note of. And also for yourself to think about, you know, what is the client actually prioritizing and how are we addressing that? Other things I always make sure to address here are, as you mentioned at the very beginning, suicidal ideation, 
um, homicidal ideation, any delusions. These can be a number of different things, romantic delusions, grandiose delusions, bodily sensations. And they um, also think about um, preoccupation. Are they really focused in, zeroed in, and honed in on one topic and one topic only, um, where they won't let you talk about anything else um, that I think approaches the level of preoccupation. And that's helpful to know that that's what's dominating someone's thoughts um, in someone's mind. When I think about perception, I'm gonna go through these just because they're a little bit more straightforward. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna watch a really quick video and I'll get your thoughts on a mental status exam there. Um, but with these last remaining ones for perception, this is the last one I think that we came up with um, within our group. I think of this as both being um, informed from what the client is telling you and from what you're seeing. So it's both subjective and observed. And I think about this as um, what is the individual perceiving and or experiencing at that moment? So I will comment on auditory hallucinations. To do this for a mental status exam, I will usually ask the question as well. Um, are you hearing things that others might not be hearing? Are you seeing things that others might not be seeing? And then I'm also watching them and examining them. Um, does it look like they're appearing? Does it look like um, they're responding to inter internal stimuli? Do they look like they're internally preoccupied? So what that means is, are they um, engaging with something that no one else can see, that only they are perceiving? Um, for example, if they're hearing voices, they might be talking out loud to someone who's not there or gesticulating in a certain direction. Um, and that can go for visual hallucinations as well. For insight and judgment, um, this took me a bit of time to really get under my belt as well. I think that this is something that is observed. It's based on what you see and what you hear. And um, for insight, I define it as um, an awareness and understanding of one's own situation and condition. Um, so for example, uh, I think about, are they able to reality test, which means you know, if they're having very significant auditory hallucinations, hearing things that no one else can hear, can they say during the interview, you know, I know that it's just in my head or I know that I'm the only one that can hear it, but it still bothers me, which shows that they know they're experiencing or perceiving something that's different. Um, or are they able to reality test around paranoia? So for example, if someone's following them around and that's not quite the case, um, you know, could they engage in a discussion with you about it? Um, I also note, um, again, like I said, mental status exam is always about two data points or a trend. So I think about it, um, how are they doing since the last time I saw them? So I qualify their insight as being poor or limited or fair. And then I also make a note to say, is it worsening or improving or just about the same as the last time that I saw them? One note I wanna make with insight is this is very tricky um, and sticky as clinicians because even though I'm saying that our insight and judgment that what we're commenting on is observed, at the end of the day, the entire mental status exam is subjective to us. <laughs> we are the ones who are writing it. It's personalized to us. Someone else might come by and say something completely different, especially when it comes to insight. And I, I, you know, I try my best to be sensitive of this. Um, someone might be experiencing paranoia that is very real to them. Um, that they're not able to reality test around because that is their reality and because of society and the way that um, the social construct exists. So I just want to keep that in mind that uh, insight uh, can be very tricky to think about and it's helpful to talk to other people, um, you know, collaterals of members that we're assessing um, in order to engage whether or not their insight is limited or actually if it's pretty spot on. Um, in terms of judgment, I think about this as someone's demonstrated ability to make good decisions. Are they able to appreciate the consequences of their decisions? Can they make decisions in a way that will protect or benefit themselves or others? And I think about this as poor, limited, and fair as well. Um, you know, with judgment, unfortunately, in many mental status exams, it's limited to agrees with treatment recommendations or complying with medical treatment. Um, and it's just so much more than that. And someone could be exhibiting good judgment for them personally um, by not going along with treatment recommendations. And we just might be short-sighted and not recognizing that. So again, I think insight and judgment, um, it can be difficult. And as much as we can, you know, try to keep in mind that in the end, it is subjective to each of us um, as a clinician and, and as the observer. And um, and finally, I think about cognition. So cognition is something that is observed. Um, it's based on responses to questioning. Um, 
And this assesses someone's level of cognition or thinking. And I always like to put down um, someone's educational level to help provide context. Someone with a first grade um, level of reading or education is gonna be very different from someone who has a postgraduate degree, for example. And um, some things that I include in cognition include alertness. Are they sleeping or somnolent? Are they lethargic and falling asleep? Um, or are they really able to pay attention? Um, are they oriented? Usually what this means is, um, do they know who they are? Do they know where they are? And do they know what today's date is? So usually you'll see this noted as A and O times three, which means alert and oriented to person, place, and time. Sometimes you'll see A and O times four, which is um, situation. Do they know why you're talking to them at that moment? Um, we also think about executive functioning, the, some of the ability to plan or organize, and then memory. Um, uh, attention, concentration, calculation. Usually we do serial sevens where someone's subtracting seven from a hundred. Um, and then we think about abstract reasoning. Can they tell you what an idiom means um, or that can you um, assess, um, you know, the difference between, or sorry, a similarity between an, an apple and an orange, for example. So these are just some quick things from Monosas exam. Um, and before I show you a little video, it's just a you know, one to two minute clip um, to get your thoughts on what you would say about this Monosas exam. I just wanted to pause to see if there are any questions from the group. Well, I'm, I, I'll, I'll get this set up. Okay. All right. Why don't we watch just a one to two minute clip to close out? Oh, I got a question. What, where would you capture concerns or thoughts about receptive slash expressive language? Um, I think for the mental status exam, well, let me know if you have anything more to say on that. The way that I think about it is I will just note what I am seeing. Um, in speech, for example, and in thought process and thought content. Um, but the way that I'm evaluating it will all go down in my assessment. So any thoughts that I have, my evaluation um, will probably go down below mental status exam. What is the difference between attention and concentration? It's such a good question. Um, this is something that I think about myself as well. Um, I the way that it's evaluated, um, one of the ways is reading out loud a series of letters and telling someone to tap down every time they hear the letter A. Um, so I think about attention and concentration as actually being the same thing, but that that's how you would at least assess it. Okay. All right, let me play. The, um, the other way that it's assessed is uh, spelling world backwards. Um, so I actually think spelling world backwards takes concentration because it takes focus um, to think about the word world and then how you might flip it around. And then attention would actually be more something like, are they able to um, be in the moment, stay present, and recognize changes or differences that you're trying to get them to note. And that's the thing of tapping their hand every time they hear the letter A. So actually that's how I would say the difference between attention and concentration is. Excellent, thanks so much. And let me just play this quick video. This is a video from 2011. Um, it's an interview that Charlie Sheen did with ABC News. And um, when you're looking at this, you know, think about how you would comment on his appearance, behavior, speech, mood, affect, thought process, thought content perceptual disturbances, um, insight, and judgment. Your anger and your hate, I think, is coming off as erratic to people. Passion, my passion. It's all okay, passion. your passion yes. is coming off as erratic right. to people. Right, well, you borrow my brain for five seconds and just be like, dude, can't handle it. Unplug this bastard, yeah, because it just, it fires in a way that is, um, I don't know, maybe not from this particular uh, terrestrial uh, realm. I think some of those things that you're putting out there are making people think something's wrong with you. That's, that's up to, that has nothing to do with me, really. I mean, they're, they're entitled to, I suppose, interpret stuff um, as they must. Some are, a doctor of. What are some are saying that of? you're bipolar. Wow, what does that mean? I guess that, you know, you're on two ends of the spectrum. Wow, 
And then what? What's the cure? Medicine? Make me like them? Not gonna happen. I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. Now what? If I'm bipolar, aren't there moments where a guy like crashes and like in the corner like, oh my God, it's all my mom's fault? Shut up. Shut up. Stop. Move forward. Have you had any celebrities reach out to you to oh, try yeah. and help you? Oh yeah, yeah, like radical people like Sean Penn and Mel Gibson and Colin Farrell and just radical people and it's and they're not telling me what to do. Who gave um, you the best piece of advice? Well, they didn't give me any advice and 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 within that there's great advice. Just it's just it was just love. And so, you know, um, just to just to see it's oftentimes says unknown, but occasionally, you know, a giant marquee name comes through on your caller ID and it's like winning. When was the last time you used Use, uh, see, I don't use, I use a blender, I use a vacuum cleaner, I use, uh, you know, I, you know, household items. Uh, when was the last time I ingested or took drugs? Yes, when you was the last time you took drugs? Such an AA, stupid um, expression or term. Uh, I don't remember. I do not remember. A week ago, two weeks ago, Maybe a month two days ago, ago. six weeks. I don't know. I don't know. It was a couple days before. Okay. 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 So, um, were you guys able to hear that okay? Oh, that's really helpful actually. Yes, okay, great. I never know if my audio goes through. I had to click the thing to make sure that it's shared. So let me just get back so we can use this as just a, a template. Um, have any of you seen that video before, by the way? First time. Some of you have, okay. So why don't we just go down the line and we'll just do this as quick call outs and feel free to type whatever comes to mind. What, what would you say about his appearance? And it doesn't have to be in any specific order, um, but just you know, throw some thoughts out. Smoking. Absolutely, I would make a note of that. That gets to the context of the situation. Yep. Sweaty. Great. The black box again, you guys, is my chat here. Um, so appearance-wise, we definitely note that he's smoking. That could even show up in behavior, for example, to describe that. But appearance, I think it definitely belongs there. And again, in the end of the day, it doesn't really matter where you put it to me as long as it's noted somewhere. Um, Don, you're mentioning that in appearance, you might say that he's sweaty. Behavior-wise, um, he seemed pretty agitated or, or guarded. Um, I might even say uh, sarcastic. Anything else that you guys might use for behavior and appearance? Unkempt, I might say something about his hair looking a little uh, tousled, for example. Um, one of you said, uh, perhaps in behavior, you could say that he's defensive. Okay, getting to speech, it seems like his speech is circumstantial. Um, under behavior, I would say that he has pretty intense eye contact. I would certainly agree with that. How about um, his mood? Is there, you know, a certain quotation mark that you might pull from what you heard? I'm by winning is what he said. I absolutely, I think, would put that as well in direct quotes. I'm by winning. And how about his affect? Does it seem congruent with his mood? Yep, reading my mind on, <laughs> exactly. What kind of word, if you had a radio station you had to choose, you know, what would you say his, his affect was? 
for the range. Expansive, I agree. You can tell that from his gesticulations. You can tell that from the way that his voice raises as he's talking about himself. Um, and even here, um, either in behavior or in affect, I might put irritable as well. Um, excellent. Thought process, we got to, as Susan had said, um, circumstantial, thought content, any delusions, annoyed would be another word. Great, okay. I'll say just for the, in the interest of time, I know we have three minutes left, um, but this has been uh, so wonderful to go through with you. And thank you so much for all your interaction with me and staying engaged. I know it's hard through Zoom, especially when I can't see your faces or hear your voices, um, but I really appreciate you chatting into the box. I think in terms of perception for him, um, just wrapping this up, uh, be difficult to tell. Uh, we didn't ask him directly. Uh, to me, it did not appear that he was internally preoccupied or responding to internal stimuli. Um, insight and judgment, again, uh, we could comment on and cognition, you would have to actually ask those questions to be able to determine that. But I think for the most part, you all are really able to capture um, what he looks like in that interview uh, for someone else to point out. Um, so we have just, I think, two to three minutes left. Uh, any remaining thoughts? I hope that this was helpful. I know it can be a drag to just go through PowerPoints, um, but I really appreciate your time. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, you guys are the best. <laughs> Yes, I can send the slides, absolutely. If you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm just, .org. I'm just getting to the very end. There we go. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll give you back one minute of your time. Um, I really enjoyed it. And Elizabeth, I'll have to stay on and read the chat that you sent me about your presentation tips. But please enjoy the rest of your sunny afternoons and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.